Hey, this is John Reed. I've got a super special guest, Sam Yen. How's it going? Hey, John. How's it going? Doing well. This is the first time I've ever got you on a podcast. This is cool. Plus, we're not an SAP show, which is double cool. Yeah, design conference. Yeah, we're at a design conference. We're at Enterprise UX 2017. And actually, for the listeners, we're not, not going to actually talk about SAP in this segment of the podcast. We've both sworn that it's not going to happen. So uh, we're going to talk more generally about design stuff. But there are a couple of interesting SAP things I want to get into that, that I didn't know about. We got to get to that. But but first, just in general, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, you, you spoke earlier today. Uh, I know you were called out yesterday on secret mission, but what, what have you learned today? Uh, I'm just blown away by kind of this the, the rapid maturity of the, the UX industry, especially in the enterprise space. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the topics just over the last couple of years have, have gotten to the point now where uh, we've, we've gone way past uh, the craft and, uh, and, and, and how um, you, you bring these things into dialogues into the organizations and, and, and more into uh, bigger uh, issues like, like breaking through silos. Those, those were some of the topics yeah. this morning and, 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 and organizational transformation and, and leaving a legacy. I mean, these are, these are mature topics that shows how much the industry has moved. Yeah, I think so, because even a couple of, of years ago, there was just a, a lot of a lot of just question about what is enterprise UX. And now you're hearing like really pretty sophisticated approaches to research and modeling. And uh, but what I am picking up on is new challenges, things, for example, like how do I scale what I'm doing? And and a lot of designers that I think are coming up against frustrations in their organizations around the fact that the light bulbs haven't necessarily gone off universally, right? It's it's a process. So even if you your your method is getting better, you still have to engage a lot of people in this that are maybe not used to the principles. So yeah, I, I think a lot of people in in the enterprise space and the organizations that they're part of um, have had a long history of doing things a certain way, and mm -hmm. especially in the in the enterprise space, it's been very successful. Right? Yeah, um, and it's I think it's only recently where. Uh, you see this convergence where uh, the types of experiences that you see in the consumer industry are, are expected also in the enterprise space. So I think that's what's driving uh, a lot of the new attention. Right. Um, that being said, organizations are not set up to do that yet. One thing you spoke about in your talk was that you spoke directly to this problem of incremental innovation. Tell us about that. Yeah, no, um, it, it, I think it goes back to how you define innovation in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I, I like to show this equation, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know where I got it from, uh, yeah. so I can't, I can't cite it, but I've been using it now for a number of years. But it's, it's, it's a simple one. It's innovation is equal to creativity times execution, right? Um, which, which makes sense, right? If you, if, you think about, if you think about the fact that introducing new innovation in the world isn't just about big ideas, not just pure mm -hmm. creativity, because you have to get it into the marketplace, yeah. but it's not just about execution either because that's just making things slightly more efficient right um, so it's a combination of the both and, and I see execution as like incremental innovation but you really need creativity in terms of that break those breakthrough ideas and you bring it together and that's how you achieve innovation one thing that I've been struck by also is is even experienced designers at this conference don't necessarily have answers to some of the things they're seeing now I mean some of the things are moving really fast with voice activated stuff um, you know, I mean, I never thought I'd be talking to a machine in the corner of my bedroom, like interacting with it. Yeah. But if you, yeah. uh, if you, if you look at kids these days, like I, I have kids, I have yeah. an eight, eight year old and a 10 year old and, uh, they use uh, Siri and Alexa for everything. You know, right. They don't want to, they don't want to thumb on a keyboard. They, they want to just talk to a, uh, talk to a device and, and get the answers right away. Um, yeah, if you, if you think about it in our industry, um, We've been on, you know, we've been using graphical user interfaces now for for a number of years, right? It's, yeah. It started in the '70s with Xerox Park and and, and those folks, and uh, it's, it's really taken 30, 40 years for it to mature to the point where things like design patterns, interaction patterns have been established, um, and now we're kind of in this brave new world where we're kind of moving beyond the graphical user interface, and some people call it the conversational user interface, whether it's texting, mm -hmm. natural language, or or speaking, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, it, we're, we're really early uh, because there, there's no standards, right? Um, you, you have to, if you want to get something done on, on an Apple device, you have to talk in a different syntax and language versus Amazon or, you know, that, that same Apple device that you might have in the office when you get into your car and you plug it into your car to do the exact same thing. Sometimes you have to say different words and use different commands. So we're, we're really early. Yeah. Another interesting thing, IBM 
uh, one of one of the exhibitors here um, had a whiteboard up every day where you could kind of just write sticky note things. They had one on enterprise hopes and fears for UX and design. And in the fears section, someone had just written Watson <laughs> yeah. uh, as a sticky note. And um, I, I thought IBM were terrific sports for just kind of leaving that up there. But they said the person that wrote that was just sort of expressing concern around sort of the, I guess, giving up a lot of control to machines. And I think that's an interesting part of the dynamic also when you think about that sometimes the best interface of the future is going to be no interface. Like, how do I remove the human from the equation? But then there's challenges associated with that too. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's that's a concern that I also share. Right, as, yeah. as a designer, you're always talking, you're always thinking about how to how to how to make sure that the human is centered in the experience. Um, but I would argue that um, you know this isn't something new. Artificial intelligence has been around since yeah. the '60s, um, and. Uh, uh, I, I had m I mentioned Doug Engelbart in the talk uh, in terms of you know their their concept way back when in, in the late '60s, early '70s, where they they talked about technology and the purpose of technology not to replace humans but to augment human capabilities. And there was also a, a talk at South by Southwest this year where one of my colleagues went and they well, the, the speaker said uh, you know one one of the ways that you could look at AI is you know put a mirror to AI and mm -hmm. and it's uh, IA and it's intelligence augmentation instead of artificial intelligence. So look at the end of the day you know there's there's going to be Technology, um, but at some point uh, there's there's going to be some human interaction, some so, some some human in the loop somewhere. Um, so you know what makes me motivated, and what I think we all need to do, especially as designers, is to figure out you know again how to how to think about the human in the loop, and how do you augment right. what a human is actually good at, and let the computers do what they're good at. And I think that comes back to the importance of 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 that. I don't want to. Say, I guess research is sort of a generic word for it, but just really understanding your constituents. And I, I really enjoyed the talk by um, Ariel this morning around the war, her work in New York City and how you know in her case her constituents include the homeless, and so those are some of the people that they went out and interviewed and talked with. And and it was the authority of knowing about those experiences that has allowed her to create models that ultimately help to change the system a little bit, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's the fundamental principle of design, right? You know, design is often called user-centered design. So yeah. the, the first step is identifying who your user is in whatever context you're right. in. So even in the context of the future where you have right. uh, more advanced computing power and, and the ability to do certain things that may have been done today, yeah. you still have to identify in that future vision, you know, who are the users and how can technology uh, work in harmony with, with the users and what mm -hmm. experience are you trying to create with that. I think one really interesting thing about this show is that most of the people here aren't really interested in having narrow conversations around like design tactics. Like, like there are a few of those conversations, but and there are some people that are not designers anymore who are more like managers. But but design seems to be more of a mentality here than than like than like a skill set. If that makes sense. Yeah, because especially if you have a design background, you go to school and you learn the craft, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's, again, I was talking earlier about the maturity of the industry. Um, I think those are pretty well known at, at this point. Um, sure, yeah. there's always best practices you could learn in terms of you know what works in different types of industries. If you look at it from a business perspective, you know, and I think this is why it different, we differentiate also sometimes consumer versus enterprise. Enterprise design sometimes is practiced in large scale organizations. And if you really want to make an impact, you know, the impact isn't necessarily always going to be on the user experience level, mm. but it's taking the design practices, and sometimes this is called design thinking, right. and making an organization more innovative by discovering kind of what's the potential and you know what are potential new solutions that you could offer to users, not, not only today, but for the next five, 10, 15 years, what's your future vision? Mm. Um, and especially you know, in, in the tech industry, um, where you know, when, when we talk a lot about digital transformation, um, Although technology is, uh, is is obviously fueling a lot of the innovations, um, really it's it's the experience, right? If you look at the disruptors right. in, in in the tech industry, whether it's Airbnb or Facebook or whatever, it's not that it's uh, it's it's the new technology, but it's the new experience that you're able to deliver for the end consumers, which is so different from the experience that they have today. Yeah, and and in her talk around working in the New York City governance, when when she did that research and brought those people in the same room together. There were two things she was getting at. One was 
I got to understand details around what you do that might not fit into what I thought. But the other piece was, I want to push you out of your day to day and talk more broadly about the future and what's possible. Like, and, and that's really important too, right? Because people get so stuck in their day to day that they, that, and, and they have the ability to think around corners, but they're not really given that opportunity, you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't remember if it was Ariel or one of the other presenters, but they had something called the, the empathy map. Mm -hmm. um, and what, it, what, what they did was they put the user in the center of it, and then they said, um, it, listen to what people say, see what they do, understand how they feel, and right. try to understand how they think. Um, yeah. and, and I think too oftentimes we, we think of research as just interviewing people and listening to what they say, um, but, but a lot of that is um, actually going into their context and just observing what's going on because sometimes mm -hmm. there are, they'll say one thing but actually do something else. And the deeper insights are usually kind of the things mm -hmm. where you're learning about how they're feeling and how they're thinking. Um, there's a famous uh, line from, uh, I think Henry Ford said, if I asked everybody what they wanted, they would have said, I wanted a faster horse. Right. Right. But the, the deeper insight was they needed to get somewhere much, much faster in a more efficient way. Um, so, so that's an example of what, what I mean by that. Yeah, I'm just looking for uh, one of the presenters. Oh, uh, Bob Schwartz, who came on right before you for GE Healthcare. And I had talked with him at the reception the other night as well. I th you think you were there for part of that. But some really powerful stuff they've done around um, getting kids to willingly take MRIs without um, without taking like going under completely anesthetically, which is kind of dangerous, and to take away that fear and like all the assumptions that have to be changed around that, where they turned it into an adventure. Basically, they got into the kids' sort of frame of mind. Yeah, I, whole I, experience I, I could, could go story. into a little bit more detail on that story. Yeah. There's a there's an engineer named Doug Dietz. Yeah, and and that was his MRI, and I think it was award winning MRI. And he he tells the story so passionately about. Yeah, you know, he was invited to the unveiling of this uh, this new MRI at, at one of the hospitals. And the way he describes it, you know, he was so proud because he saw it. It was like in the hospital room and it was in underneath shining lights. It was bright and shiny. And it was just like taking a moment to say, oh, my God, I worked so hard on this. And here it is. And then he saw like in the corner of the room, this child that was just trembling and crying. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he realized, oh, my God, I've created something that causes, you know, so much fear uh, for this young child. Um, and yeah. uh and uh, they, 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 they worked um, and they, they, went, well, they worked through a design thinking process. They, they realized, you know, the, um, they, they focused again on the feeling, right? The, the, emotion, the right. emotions of what, the, what, and what, what they were seeing, not necessarily that the, 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 the child said, you need to create an adventure series for me, but they realized that, hey, there was, there was, a, there was a fear for this. And the, and the way that they overcome this was they actually created, it, was, it wasn't just the fact that they, put a bunch of stickers on the MRI, our, 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 our MRI machine uh, to make it look like um, a submarine, which is what the, the, mm -hmm. the thing was. But they sent a kit uh, to, the, to the patient, to, to the child, a week before, which was a mm -hmm. storybook where they read the context and how mm. the, uh, the child was going to be the hero of the story and what to expect. And one of the missions was to lie still uh, during kind of this critical right. phase. Yeah. Um, and, and because of that, you know, I, I think they said they, they reduced uh, the need for sedation by over 90%. Yeah. I and mean, that's amazing, right? Yeah. And, and I think it just, it just shows you how much feeling you can imbue into the process if you have the proper sort of empathy and understanding for the other side. And so when I think about that design sensibility, I think about, first of all, involving external stakeholders like way earlier in the process and really understanding them, but also coming up for air more often. And I know we're not going to get into the SAP part yet, but I know that that's something you guys have adopted a lot too, as far as like, you know, you don't want to hunker down in, in Waldorf anymore and spend three years trying to build something. No company wants to do that anymore if they're doing things right, right? It's not about who can come up with the best thing on their own. It's, it's about how can you collaborate with your customers to build something better? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, if you think, uh, especially for, for developers, right? Um, agile as a process was, was, was really different from the waterfall methodology because it introduced yeah. this notion of iterations. Um, and you do a short sprint and then you come back and you check whether you're, you're building the right thing, whether the boundary conditions have shifted and then you have room to kind of continue to do that. I think when you add design thinking also to that, um, it's, it's, it's important because if you, um, one, one of the things that I was saying is design thinking introduces the notion of problem finding, you know, are you solving the right, right. problem to even start with? Um, right. uh, if, if you only introduce agile 
you know, one of the, one of the fears is you, you, you just have a more efficient and faster way of, to get garbage out if you're solving the wrong problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so introduce design thinking into it. And then, and then once you know that you have the right problem that you're solving, then as you're doing your iterations within agile, you're checking the business conditions, you're checking kind of the technical uh, stuff of what you've built, but then you're also every single time you're checking with your end user to make sure that you're still aligned with what they need. Yeah. And the other piece of this, I think, and it's something you touched on in your talk, though, is that if if we're going to live up to the potential of this methodology, then we have to think about the diversity in the room. And that includes designers, too, right? And there's a pretty good gender diversity here in the speakers and, and from what I can tell in the audience, but not so much otherwise. It's kind of typical what you would expect at a show like this, which is not to bash the show. It just as you go to tech shows, this is what you see. But you talking about that too in terms of like we can become design snobs and say, oh, so and so is went to Stanford or whatever, so and we're overlooking all these incredibly talented people that, that bring a lot to the table. Yeah, it, it's just uh it's it's too bad that you know design um, a, lo a lot of people look at design as as associated with creativity and the creative economy as the future of you know what we need to do to mm -hmm. to push um, and, and be part of you know the you know be part of the the leading um, parts of the economy right you know creativity is 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 one of the things that we feel at least for now machine learning is not mm -hmm. going to overtake in in the near future um, so creativity is so important but if you look at where you learn about creativity. It's it's the design schools and the design schools typically are are very, you know, it, it are you know design schools are locked up in very prestigious universities, um, and some of the I, I believe that some of the principles, especially in design thinking, design as a craft is is another thing, but design thinking, you know, the, the, this notion of understanding the user, right, um, um, starting with the finding the right problem before solving the problem, these are concepts which are common sense. You know, why yeah. why do you have to go to the most elite schools to be able to learn those right. types of things, right? So so I, I'm a firm believer that we, you know, we we need to somehow democratize those concepts. Everybody, mm -hmm. I think uh, this it's one of the reasons why I think at the D school and and also, you know, Hasso likes it so much as he feels that these are just skills that everybody needs to have coming out of school going yeah. forward. Um, yeah. And and again, if you're trying to find problems and you're, and you're solving for uh, for for end users, right? Um, you know, the, the people that are identifying the needs and concerns of of your your end population should kind of match that population at some point. Okay. Well, I think that was a fairly good endpoint for that part. Any anything else that uh, actually, you know, what surprised me was, um, you know, when when you were introduced, they said you wanted to be an astronaut when you were a kid. But what I didn't know is that you pursued that actually really seriously. I did. I did. I um, so I realized early on I wouldn't be able to be an astronaut because I had yeah. more glasses, right? Um, yeah. I think they could do corrective surgery now, but uh, back back then, you know, that automatically disqualified you. Yeah. Um, but I I kept up the dream, right? Uh, I I went to space camp when I was a kid, and then uh, I ended up studying aerospace engineering both at Cornell and, and at Stanford. I my dream then was to work at NASA, and I did that for a little yeah. bit, and I worked at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and then had a change. So uh, when I was uh, kind of going from my master's to my PhD at Stanford, I was part of the aerospace program. Yeah. And we did a joint research project with a jet propulsion laboratory in Pasadena. Okay. Uh, so I was part of the aerospace team and I was I doing you know, the analytical stuff. And then there was a design research team that was also there studying the same team. Okay. But they were looking at creativity and, uh, and how teams work together to, to work on creative projects. So I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, so I made a note to myself when I got back to Stanford in the fall, I would take a design class and I was just hooked ever since. And I switched I over and I did a PhD wow. in design. That's amazing. So how do you keep your, your design curiosity and growth satiated for yourself? I know you learn a lot from working with customers and stuff. Do you have a, a discipline for yourself in terms of how you train and grow or? Yeah, I, I think design is, 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 is great um, as, a, as a career because you're constantly learning, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're constantly going and learning about the, the needs. You know, we're in the enterprise, so I'm constantly learning about different business needs. And as I'm talking to different business users, I'm learning about different industries all the time. Um, I also um, am blessed because um, uh, I work about 10 minutes from Stanford and I'm able to mm. continue to With also teaching as teach well. yeah. um, and, 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 and not only teach, but also learn, right. um, you know, whether it's, you know, working uh, in executive ed and learning from executives that come in or learning from business school students in the business school or learning from um, you know, people from the D school. So it, it's, it's, it's a great way to continue to learn both from industry and also academia. Mm. 
So how would you advise someone from a more, let's say they're more of a technical ERP software kind of background or technical background who is intrigued by these concepts, but isn't really designer trained? How, how, what should they do? I think having uh, an appreciation for design and especially the, the, the fundamental concepts, mm -hmm. um, understanding who it, who it is you're building for, understanding what their needs are, constantly making sure that what you're building is relevant for your end user, mm -hmm. that'll, that'll make you better in whatever you do, whether you're in business or whether you're in development or, yeah. or anything else. You and I were talking about the stat you shared that the ideal ratio for develop designers to developers might be one designer for every 10 developers and how like especially with massive enterprise software companies that's like almost financially impossible plus there's not maybe not even that many good designers in the world to meet that criteria what that tells me is that there's a lot of room to have impact if you're not that designer to, to grow into a role where you can make more of a difference in that yeah, I'm, I'm going to reference, it was a Fast Company article, now it's a couple a couple years ago, and they were doing an interview with an ex-Apple uh, designer, and, yeah. and he was he was saying, look, I want to demystify a couple things about Apple design. He said, number one, Apple doesn't have the most designers, um, and, and, then, and then he said, Apple doesn't even necessarily have the best designers. Um, side note on that, when I, when I told that to Apple, they said, that's why he's an ex-Apple designer. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> nice, but but, uh, but but what he what he said was the most important thing about Apple was it was a, there was a design culture from Steve all the way down, and everybody understood the the value of design. Everybody cared about design, even though they weren't quote unquote designers. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's where you know that's what an organization sh should try to strive for. All right, do you have anything else you want to say about design before we talk about SAP? No, we can move to SAP. Okay, all right. So let's take a brief pause, and we'll turn to talk about SAP.